So uh, good evening, my name is Stan Rowe. I'm, I'm an inventor and an innovator. Now those two things are not the same. Inventors are people who, well, they dream of new ideas, hopefully things that they can patent or trademark. And innovators are people that really develop those ideas. Now sometimes innovators are good, uh, are, are good inventors, and sometimes inventors are good innovators, but not always. Those can be very, very different. One guy who was an amazing innovator was this guy, Thomas Edison. Over a thousand US patents, 2,300 patents worldwide. And of course, I think most of you are familiar with you know, him. He's extremely famous for developing the light bulb. And of course, he, he failed a thousand times to develop this. Who, who knew it would develop into this, right? But I digress. You know, what I love about Thomas Edison is something different. He was a great nihilist. A great nihilist. Well, what does nihilism have to do with innovation? You see, nihilism is about challenging the standards of your society, the standards of care, the standards of function. They go up against this thing we call the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist is, you know, that thing that hovers over us. It's almost invisible. It's it's our culture. It's the things that we love about our lives, the things we appreciate. But the nihilist are people who say, we can do better. Hmm. You know, Thomas Edison, he, in his time, he thought about developing a light bulb when people marveled at gas lighting. Gas lighting lit up London for the first time. You could walk the streets at night and see where you were going. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it also lit up homes. Yeah, a few of them exploded, but they still do. <laughs> but it was amazing, you know? And you know what people said? People said, I remember when I had to read by an oil lamp. It was horrible. I could barely see anything. It was smoky. And now, we have gas lamps. They're amazing. And Thomas Edison said, that's no good. There were at least two or three other people working on the electric light. But he was the guy who said, I'm going to make that happen. He was a great inventor and a great innovator. This happens in medicine too. You know, this is something I got to work on for quite a long time. This is a disease called aortic stenosis. It occurs when patients who are 70, 80, 90 years old, 12% of patients over the age of 50, 50, uh, 75 have valvular heart disease. It's a big problem. This is what a healthy heart looks like. And you can see right here, here's a healthy aortic valve. It opens all the way up. You can see it from the side right here. Another nice view from the top. That's a healthy aortic valve. Your Aortic valve is 4.5 square centimeters in valve area, and all of the blood supply goes from your left ventricle to the ascending aorta through that aortic valve. So imagine you're 70, 80, 90 years old, and now your heart valve looks like this. It's got this calcium on it. It just barely, barely opens. It's 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 square centimeters, and you have to squeeze all of your blood supply through that really narrowed orifice. It's really hard, really hard on these old patients. They go through a long latent period, meaning they're asymptomatic, we hope. And then once the symptoms appear, they fall off a cliff. It's more aggressive than most cancers, okay? What are the symptoms? They have angina, chest pain, syncope, fainting spells. They have heart failure, and they have sudden death. The treatment for this is amazing. It's open heart surgery. And what the cardiothoracic surgeon does is amazing. He opens up your chest. He basically cuts it open with a sternal saw while you're anesthetized. Opens up your chest. He removes your diseased valve under cardiopulmonary bypass. And then he sews in very carefully a brand new valve. And it will last you decades. So it's an amazing procedure. 
couple of dreamers like these guys, this is a very interesting study of the zeitgeist and nihilism right here. Doctors Malopoulos and Pavnik from 1980 and 1992 said, you know, that's not good enough. What we ought to do is have a valve that you can put in without open heart surgery. We'll put it in through the leg, through an artery. And then we'll thread it up and then we'll take this cage here and expand this cage and inflate this ball and it will go up and down. During systole it goes up and allows blood flow and during diastole it goes down and seals, creating a one-way valve. And this one similarly is a cage that you expand but this is a, a disc and it tilts sideways during diastole to block flow and vertically during systole to allow flow. What's interesting is these guys were great nihilists. They were also very much touched, touched by the zeitgeist because this was the surgical valve design in 1980 and this was the surgical valve design in 1992. They were innovating but they were also touched by this great zeitgeist. About 1995, I learned about this idea from Dr. Cribier. Dr. Cribier was the chief of cardiology in Rouen, France, and he had this great idea of making a transcatheter valve that looked differently and behaved differently. This is great invention. You like any of these ideas? Think they work? How do you know? We had a few questions. And these are the questions you face when you go from invention to innovation. How do you translate this into a real device? What are the compressive forces that this thing has to, to uh, see in the human body? How do you make this valve um, frame form a circular valve? Because if it's not circular, it will wear out, okay? How do you manufacture something like that? Because the, the tubing didn't exist to make it. What is the mat preferred material? There were a lot of different metals we could use to form a frame like this. How do you attach a fixed diameter valve to an expandable and collapsible frame? How do you make that attachment durable? How do you seal around it so you don't have leakage around the valve? What's the optimal valve design for hemodynamics and to make it really small and to prevent tissue damage? And then what valve material do you use? And how long does it take you to figure all that out? But that's not all you have to know, actually, because you have to define the functional parameters. What is it the market really needs? Because things like how long does it really need to last is really important. How large can you make this thing and still be okay to introduce it through the leg? And what's the best way to deliver it? Which blood vessel, which approach? There's a lot of different ways I could get there. What patients will really clinically benefit from this? And how will I prove safety and efficacy? Because I have to do that to every regulator. And will hospitals pay enough to justify the R&D cost? Will there be enough patients to make this worthwhile? Well, we made one. This is what it looks like. We did make it out of pericardial tissue and we were able to prove that it worked, but I want you to understand it's not just about the technology. When you're doing innovation, it takes a whole lot more study and understanding and definition right up front to get it right. You have to understand what the customer really needs and define it. You have to understand performance requirements. You have to understand things like how am I going to distribute it and what are the costs and pricing and I have to get as much of this right up front as I can because no one's going to want to invest in your idea until you know about those things. Well, I went out and tried to get funding for this early on. And I would go in and talk to venture capitalists and they would say, that's an interesting idea. You're going to make a percutaneous heart valve. I haven't heard of that before. And we would leave and they'd pick up the phone and they'd call the expert. And the expert in the world is the cardiothoracic surgeon. This is what he does every day. He does valvular heart repair. And the surgeon says, you can't crimp down surgical valves like that. You'll destroy the tissue. They'll, they'll be damaged. We 
put patients on cardiopulmonary bypass, we use 30 sutures to hold one of these in place, and you're going to use how many? Zero? <laughs> That's never going to work. And by the way, you can't open up aortic stenosis. You're just going to stick this thing in and open it up. Um, it's a rock. We take this out every day. That will never work. If you tried to open it up, it would fragment. Those fragments would go downstream and every patient would have a stroke. And even if you could make one, it would be inferior to surgical valves. You can't make something like that durable. And by the way, cardiologists don't know anything about this business and ought to stay out of it. Other than that, they were very supportive. <laughs> well, the reality was different. The reality was we can crimp a 29-millimeter valve down to 5 millimeters. Embolization of valves is not a problem. We use the disease to hold the valve in place. We can always open up diseased valve with a stented valve. Stroke is equal to or lower than surgery. Transcatheter valves are superior in performance to surgical valves. We can make them durable for more than five years. We have patients out 12 years today. And cardiologists have learned to treat aortic stenosis disease around the world. We did our first case in April of 2002. A man that was dying on the table and we put in the very first valve. Dr. Cribier did this in Rouen, France. This guy was ashen and gray and dying. And after a one hour procedure, he sat up in bed that night and drank a glass of champagne with Dr. Cribier. It is France, you know. <laughs> Today, we've trained 400 centers around the United States. It takes a lot of work to do that. And um, our clinical results are pretty darned amazing. In fact, this, the final results of this study are going to be presented next month at the American College of Cardiology in Chicago. The O to E ratio means we take the Society of Thoracic Surgery risk score, so this is the risk of dying during surgery, and divide it by the observed mortality rate, which was 2.2%. So in patients that were at very high risk of surgical mortality, 8.6%, Observed mortality was 2.2% at 30 days. That's a 75% reduction in mortality in high-risk patients.